how to prepare for the global currency reset 2020. Today, we give you facts and figures regarding the global currency reset. Global currency reset, fact or fiction? That's the question. We will show you charts, facts and figures, giving you the evidence that a global currency reset cannot be excluded anymore. We will show you how to prepare for a global currency reset and how to prepare against other drastic measures because something will happen for sure. The figures are very, are shocking figures you will see in the chart. Don't miss this video because this video can decide if you can protect your asset efficiently or if you can lose everything you have overnight. Stay tuned. Caputo and Partners, SwissBankingLawyers.com. We fight for your money. Hello, my name is Enzo Caputo. I am an international private banking lawyer based in Zurich, Switzerland. I am the owner of the blog SwissBankingLawyers.com. This is the place where successful business people around the world find tips and solutions regarding asset protection, offshore banking, and how to pay less taxes. Stay with us. We fight for your money. Today, we discuss how likely a global currency reset is. We will give you evidence. We will give you charts, facts, and figures prepared by Silvan. Silvan is a Swiss asset manager and a Swiss financial analyst. I'm very pleased to have him here today with his very interesting charts uh, collected and made with reliable, based on reliable sources like Wikipedia and Bloomberg. Hello, Silvan, how are you today? Hello, Enzo, thank you, I'm well. Thank you for having me here. I hope you are well as well. You are very, nice. very excited to see your charts. You are very, very excited because you showed me the charts before and uh, I have to say I, I am shocked. Show, uh, show us the evidence. How we can prepare for the global currency reset and what we should do. And, but first of all, how likely a global currency reset is. Well, I, I think that's a little bit different from country to, to country, but as already dis discussed uh, in the last videos, I still see the most drastic measures mainly in the euro area. Um, I mean, that's for me most likely that's going to happen something there. I don't know when and I don't know exactly what, but just if I look at the numbers, I've seen um, all, all in the euro area, I can say that's definitely something not going very well. So. Um, sooner or later, they have to change something there, and uh, I would say um, one should be prepared when 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 this happens. So something drastic. We don't know exactly what will happen. We don't know if this is will be a global currency reset or whatever. How how likely is it? How likely is it? What what uh, in which area which are the areas concerned about is this all the world or is this all only the euro era or the united states or is a global phenomenon or where it is more where it is more dangerous or more likely that something happened yeah i said i still believe it's going to be the euro area and the reason for that is that great britain they have as you know left now the european area and i mean well, that, that was the second biggest economy in the euro. So um, that's quite severe. That's quite something. So um, they certainly lost power, the European Euro Union, when, when they lost um, Great Britain. And yeah, I would say that's all already something. And so you think especially the euro era concerns, it will concern the euro era? more than any other area. Yeah, I mean, there are huge national debts and no growth, especially in the south of the European area, right? We all that know that. Hong Greece, Italy, Spain, South Europe. Yes, and today, I mean, they, even the politicians know that and they 
they think they have to solve this problem with sending money from, from the north to the south. But um, I can show you, for example, in, in, in this graph here, that's, that's um, just not going to um, solve the, the situation we have. I mean, that's, for example, the industry production by country. And they netted, they started actually, um, they indexed at, at 2015 at 100, so at 100%, and calculated back. So that means when you take, for example, Greece here, the yellow line, you see that they were percentage-wise top somewhere close to 220% compared to the others. And yeah. I mean, that went now down to close to 80 here. And you see, for example, Austria or Germany, they were much below 100, so they had real growth, even though they are, of course, that, that, that's Corona here, the dip. They are also um, not were also not very strong. Well, well, um, Austria was very good, but Germany also took a dip now. And but at least they had some growth, you know. But if you take now the others, for example, Spain and Italy as well, you see that all those are uh, well below below the the starting level in 2000 when I started this graph. So um, yes. How will then Germany help the South Europe? So Germany should help South Europe. Well, well, today it's it's the case that they realize that something is 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 um, not um, working really well, and they are just sending money. In, in now it's in in the form of credit, right? They call it now not Corona bonds, but um, it's essentially the same. I mean, it doesn't matter which name you use, and um, yes. Um, what is also said many times in the market is um, that the euro I mean, helped, of course, Germany and other countries in the north because they had a weaker currency. And if you have a weak, weaker currency and you export a lot of goods, that usually helps. But you know there is no evidence that that, that really helped. I mean, if you, for example, look at this chart here, um, the euro started... Um, um, somewhere it depends a little bit um, on the on, on the on the country when they invented the euro, but um, the the date is actually 1990 when they started, and that's um, here the red bulk you see, and you see here the the times before the euro for Germany and. The euro, no, 1999. The euro was introduced. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and you have from 1980, for example, to 1990, that's a 10 years period, you have a growth rate of close to 5% for Germany. Yeah. And also from 1990 to 1999, you had 4.8%. And after the intervention of the euro, you have had just 2.5%. So all those guys saying out there, well, that was a big support for the, uh, for the German economy. There is just no no evidence that's really the case. I mean, not, not by numbers, at least. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Excellent. So, mm -hmm. so even if Germany will help South Europe, you think this, this help cannot change, cannot change much because we have such, such a bad economic situation? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, think about like a company. When you have a company that is always supported by the government, they're just getting yeah. every year money from the government. They just don't invent new products because they yeah. don't have to be competitive in the market anymore. And I think that's what's happening in the South. Um, I mean, that's for me not a healthy situation. That's yes, exactly. You have also numbers with, from the European Central Bank. The target balances you have a chart showing yes yes what i want to say here is is um, that i believe that um, the north is somewhat or got block blackmailable from the south because they have in the meantime collected so much debt from from the south that yeah. they that they really don't have a, another possibility than to send money to the south just have that to, the euro survives Yes, and, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And you see that here. I mean, that that actually actually started when um, money made uh, when Draghi made his famous speech 
about whatever it takes. Um, he meant with this speech that, or with this sentence, that he, he will um, rescue the euro, whatever it takes. And the solution at that time was that that they, the, the ECB, the European Central Bank, they wanted to buy, um, or the plan was to buy so many um, of the national debt, of the, of the foreign debt or the sovereign debt of those countries, of the South countries, that the interest rate gap comes very close to Germany again. And well, that happened. I mean, um, what, what still exists in the South, most people don't know that, but they still have the central banks in the South, as um, they were always there. But um, the printing press is actually um, the euro, the ECB is the, is the printing press. But um, they got a mandate from the ECB to buy as many sovereign debt of their own, own country as, as possible. But they had no money to do that, right? Um, so that they, they needed money to buy those those uh, national debts, and um, that was they took or they got um, credit loans from from the ECB, and with that money they bought their their own debt, the the debt of their own countries, and okay, that's um, what you see here. I mean, it already started 2008. <clears throat> So um, those are um, the ECB target two balances. Um, doesn't matter if it's target two or just target, it's more or less the same. Balances. What do you mean we target balance, ECB target balances? Yeah, well, uh, I said that that's um, actually money um, borrowed from the South central banks, from the central banks in the South, in the South countries, um, from the ECB. So that means, for example, if you take Germany, they have, um, um, they are in plus, um, and if you take the, the rest, they are very deeply in the minus. You see here the, the yellow line is Italy, the green line is Spain, and the red line I, I made, uh, I calculated everything together. So that's Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain, and you see that, that um, there is actually more than one billion um, wow. that is the South is in, in debt. Um, with the uh, ECB. It goes down and down the red line. Yes, and, and, and there was already a discussion in Germany many times what's happening when one of those countries leaves the, U the euro. Do they have to pay, pay back those debt? And Mario Draghi said, yes, of course, they would have to pay back that. But um, you know how it is. I mean, in reality, that's never going to happen. So. Um, and that's why I think that the North is already um, blackmailable. That means they are they have no other solution than to pay to the south, and that's that's just the ECB that we have here. But but imagine how okay. much the source the source is ECB Europe European yeah, Union. Yeah, the source is from ECB. You can see those numbers on, on the homepage of the ECB. And uh, it's a publicly accessible information. So this yeah, is sure. On, on that page, um, you you can see those information yeah. and. But imagine that's just the ECB debt. I mean, there is much more, right? There are banks, there are insurance companies in the north. They are holding debt from the south. So, um, yeah, that's that's going to be for for some countries. If one of those leave, and I think it will happen, then it's going to be very expensive. Yeah. But yet, beside Europe, where do you see other other countries? Such measures can happen. What do you think? We have well, somewhere. In the world, there are other countries where we have similar situation. Well, I think we have um, very high debt levels around the world. Um, it's hard for me to believe that it will just keep rising. And yeah. if I was right about this and there were to be a reduction in debt at some point, I would, I would say it's invitably linked to a reduction in GDP because a reduction in debt practically always ends in lower GDP numbers, right? So, um, as you can imagine, such measures are very unpopular, so I'm nobody not wants not to do that. that. Yeah, and yeah. it's therefore quite possible that other economies will first devalue the existing currency and then introduce new currencies. And Where could that be the case? Where could that be the case? They first devaluate and then they introduce a new currency. Yeah, I mean, that's all, uh, actually already happening. I, I want to show that quickly. Um, those are the ECB balance sheets, so just um, meaning all, all the 
the assets of uh, uh, central bank counted together. Um, you get a number. So and that's here. Um, that's actually sort of 2007 with one trillion. And went up now for the Fed, for example, to seven trillion. And by the way, it took a very long time to get to one trillion. So it took probably 10 or 20 years to get there. And yet now within, within 13 years, we, we have a growth of 670%. I mean, and, and it's the same for the ECB balance sheet, more or less. And you see here also the corona impact. I mean, I think that will just go on as long as possible. And at some stages, probably people will see that, that um, you know, that's not, not going to hold forever, right? Yeah, but yeah. I would say the, the US dollar will, will still hold in the world because it's, it's the biggest currency and, and uh, everyone calculates in, in US dollar and I think the US dollar won't have a problem. It will probably devaluate against other currencies, that's possible. But also here I think the, the euro is much more vulnerable than, than, the, US, than the US dollar, yeah. And how can we protect the wealth? How can we propose asset protection that works for our audience? We want to protect the assets of our audience, so we want to give Mm -hmm. Very valuable information for asset, yes, yes. For asset protection uh, for our clients. So, how can yeah. we protect assets? Uh, as I said in other videos, I would certainly look for a stable bank in a stable country with yeah. a stable government. And we have already pointed out several times how important it is to have a stable bank and a stable government. And many investors still believe that the state and the central banks will be there for them if the crisis happens. But this chart shows nicely that yeah. the state and the central banks cause many more crises than they solve. And I mean, this one here, you, you see what, what's happening when you're just printing money. Um, that's, for example, um, let, with the Bretton Woods system. Let me quickly explain that. Um, yeah. Many probably don't know um, um, the Bretton Woods system. It's already some time ago, as you see on, on, the, on the chart, on the graph. But the goal was there after the Second World War to stabilize the exchange rate between currencies so that the world trade could take place without problems and trade barriers. Um, this in turn was to stimulate the economy to an extent that trade and investment could increase. Above all, it was intended to prevent the devaluation race between na nations that occurred between the First and the Second World War. And you are you seeing here um, that actually during the, the Bretton Woods systems, we actually didn't have any banking crisis at all. And you see how it was before and how it was after. And I mean, that's things like that are just crazy, right? And yeah. uh, so investors still think that the government and the seven central banks will will help them if something happens and they probably will try but i think it's just not going to happen at some point anymore or not not help anymore right so yes okay so and, and, and you believe that switzerland can give to investors these protections just by putting some part of investment in Swiss francs, you already have hatched your portfolio. So this yes. is very simple, very simple step. So what you have to do is basically is nothing else than open an account in Switzerland and open a multi-currency account in Switzerland, diversify the currencies, but first of all, investing a big part in Swiss francs. Correct? Yes, yes. I think that, that that's a solution. Yes, a good one. And I, by the way, I don't know why, why that is, uh, why Switzerland is that stable in terms of economic numbers and also um, in terms of currency, because it could be that that's the case because they were never involved in a world war, I don't know. But the system so far was very stable. I mean, I, I can probably show that in, in with the currencies here. Um, you, yeah. you have here the, 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 the yellow one, um, 
you have the, the pound against the Swiss franc and also the blue one, the US dollar um, against the Swiss franc and they, I mean the pound, it was crazy, 90% devaluation. I mean, 90% devaluation, unbelievable, 90% devaluation. So I remember the times, one pound, you have to pay 8.8 .8 Swiss francs for one pound. This was maybe 30 years ago. Yes. 8.8 .8 Swiss francs for one pound. And today, how much is one pound today? Against the Swiss francs, I would have to look it up. But um, it's, it's always, it's all, always about 110 to 140, somewhere there. So, um, I mean, two times nothing. Uh, but uh, also the US dollar, it's trading now at 93 um, cents. And we say yeah. in, 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 in Swiss Rappen, right? That's how, it's how much was the value of the US dollar in Swiss francs in 1971? Um, yeah, that was over. That was somewhere at four. Four Swiss francs. So you have yes. to pay four Swiss francs to buy one dollar. And now we have one to one. We have parity. You have to pay one Swiss franc for one dollar, or even less, or even less. And and the, the pound is somewhere uh, around one eighteen now. I mean, that's not. Um, you see, it's just going down. Um, and what I think also is that the same is now going to happen with euro. I started here two thousand with the euro. That was the earliest number I got. Um, also at one, so that's all all indexed, and it went now down. The euro lost thirty-seven percent. Yes, and I think it's now going to happen the same than with those currencies. And I mean, just imagine if you were a pound investor and you just had a Swiss franc portfolio, just cash, not invested at all. I yeah. mean, just not making this devaluation, that would already be a very good performance, right? So, yes, that's that's what I'm saying. So that that usually worked in the past, and I believe it's going to work in the future as well. It will work in the future for sure. It will work in the future. What what else do we recommend? What else? What is classical? Of, of, of course, gold. Gold, of course. You know the other asset class. So we have the Swiss franc. We have gold. And you have you prepared also gold chart. Yes, you know? yes. I have here first uh, the chart about the real estate. Um, yeah. And the reason for that is this real estate in Switzerland usually shows relatively stable returns. I mean. Yeah. Uh, as you can see here, we also had times when real estate Switzerland was not that stable, but yeah. that was um, our real estate crisis we had in Switzerland, and that was caused by a lock, by lax lending and in, insufficient credit checks. I mean that it was possible to take 100 percent um, of the value of the house as a mortgage, and that was not very healthy and not very stable. In two right. days, we make multiple checks before you get a mortgage, so that um, they are also calculating kind of uh, an interest rate uh, at 5%, uh, a calculated interest rate at 5%, and this value can be as more than a third of your total income per year. Um, so um, we have um, at a debt level, or let's say you have to put in at least 20% equity, but we also make those those um, affordability checks um, um, when even when interest rates go up like crazy. You yeah. um, at five five percent that people can still afford their mortgages. So that's why I think the the situation today is a totally different one than than in the nineties. Okay. Um, yes. So you see here in the line. I mean, that was even two thousand and eight. That's probably important here, right? Yeah. Um, that it was very stable during that time as well. Um, that's why I think an investor can still make with, with Swiss real estate between 4 and 6%. Um, depends a little bit how much leverage he's applying. But, um, 4 and 6% a year. Yeah, and imagine if you don't have um, the devaluation on the currency plus yeah. this, this, um, this returns here. That already gives you quite good um, safe return, I would say. Yeah, safe return with a very safe investment. And let's go. Let's go to the next short about gold. Let's speak about gold. Yes. Why do um, we recommend gold? 
Well, um, as it is not surprising, gold usually um, holds very well when when um, when a national bank, central banks are increasing money supply. Yes. And that's what what I want to show here. That's the gold price, and you see here it, it was very stable. Um, I mean, we also had Bretton Woods here, as explained before. That was actually um, a time when when central banks were not able to to print money um, because the US dollar was, was pegged to the gold price, so the gold price was very stable here. But after the fall of the Bretton Woods system, I mean, you, you see how, how the gold price went up. And what I tried to do here as well is, I tried to, to, um, to index the, the money supply of the, of the National Bank, of the Fed, to the gold price. And we definitely see here a direct correlation, right? You see here that the gold price dropped when they um, lowered um, the money supplies and supply and now it's going up like crazy. And I believe that now the gold price is way too low. Um, and we should be certainly over 2,000 um, with the money supply now. And I think that's, that's what we are going to see in the, in the next and months. We so we have a gold will increase now. <laughs> This chart. This is a chart made by Bloomberg and the Federal Reserve.org. So very reliable charts. Huh? We, we are speaking. All the charts are issued by official sources and can be uh, checked in internet. So what else? What else is crisis resistant investment? What else is a crisis resistant asset class we can recommend? For example, what do you think about commodities? Commodities is is quite underpriced at the moment. Can be an alternative because it's not uh, it's not bonds, uh, so it's not currency related. It's something you can touch. Commodities. What is your opinion about commodities to diversify? Oh, well, gold is also a commodity, right? Um, and the question is always, what commodities do you want to buy? I mean, oil is not. You can't buy oil just um, just in the spot market. You have to do it over over futures, and that's. Um, you can buy commodity funds. What do you think about commodity funds? Yeah, well, I'm not a big fan of it. I mean, you always um, can diversify commodity, but um, it's really a separate issue, and you have to understand some things that are important when you invest in commodities. Here, I can see very, can say briefly that you should always remember that commodities do not yield any returns. So okay. commodities don't have interest or dividend, right? So um, in other words, one already lives quite well with gold and can leave it, can leave it at that. Um, so just to, summarize, just to summarize, what are the best, how to prepare for the global currency reset or even how to take profit from the global currency reset? So as we said, the Swiss franc, investing in Swiss franc and investing in, Swiss, in the Swiss bank account in a secure country, a secure country you are protected against a global currency reset. Swiss mm -hmm. franc, gold, Swiss real estate, gold in Switzerland, real estate, maybe commodity, commodity funds, maybe commodity funds. And what else we have? We have cryptocurrency, but I know you are not a fan of cryptocurrency because there are too many frauds there in, in, in crypto. So that's why we don't uh, enter too much in this. In this yeah, I mean, that, that can, can be one day, but, but today it's very hard. I mean, when you trade in cryptocurrencies or even if you are very successful um, um, and you want to place that money with the normal bank, it's almost impossible to, to go okay. out the cryptocurrency into no, normal, normal currencies again. And, and yeah, I mean, that could be one day, but today I think it's still too early. Okay. Yes. And we forgot something, we forgot something similar. Quality stocks, high quality stocks, of course. This yes, sure, sure. Because we have seen that in the crash, the high quality stocks, they resisted. They are crisis resistant. Correct? Yeah, okay. I mean, they probably would also drop first, right? Uh, I mean, stocks suffer usually the most when, when you are in a recession or even in a depression. Yeah. But it's certainly true that, that good companies can, can adjust their business models so that they can survive in every stage, basically. And over time, they will always grow to new highs. I mean, we have seen that. And uh, like companies like Nestle, they can, can always reinvent themselves. I mean, those products you, you need. And, and, 
that was just one example. So I don't want to say put all your money in Nestle, but um, I think everyone would agree that we have to eat something. And yes. Yes, even if it's the price. <laughs> Thank you very much, Info, for all these very interesting charts, facts, and figures. We are very impressed. Information you, that like this cannot be found in universities, not in libraries, and not in bibliotheques. If you like information just like this, please consider to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Push the subscribe button and ring the bell. By doing so, you will never miss a video. Stay with us. See you again in the next video. Thank you, Anton. Thank you very much. Thank you.